Thank you, John, and uh, thank you to Voiceless for the opportunity to uh, speak tonight on what is really a, a critical issue in human-animal relations. Um, as Manny uh, said at the introduction, I'm going to give a legal perspective of uh, speciesism, that is how uh, speciesism manifests in the law um, and how that manifestation may contribute to the sort of psychological uh, forces that perpetuate speciesist attitudes that we've heard about from uh, Brock and, and from John. I think it's really important that we do consider the law's role in this process because the law, of course, is a very important institution of society. And while fundamentally it may uh, be reactive in nature, that is, it tends to follow the uh, moral sentiment of a community rather than lead it, by reflecting that moral sentiment, it nevertheless reinforces it um, and, and provides a degree of legitimacy to it. So if that moral sense of a community in a particular point in time or, or in a particular place is one that fosters uh, sentiments of, of racism or sexism, for instance, then inevitably the law of that time and place will reflect those discriminatory influences as well. And likewise, a, a community that fosters speciesist attitudes will give rise to speciesist laws as well. And the challenge, of course, to... Um, or, I guess the first step in challenging those isms really is to identify them. So to bring them from the unconscious to the conscious uh, so that we can actually uh, engage in some degree of scrutiny and we can uh, start to reform our psychological processes but also um, our legal frameworks that, uh, that may help to perpetuate uh, speciesist attitudes. Hence the, the importance of, of the debate that we're engaged in tonight. So the manifestation of speciesism can really be traced back to the very beginnings of uh, the Western legal tradition itself. The codification of Roman law within the Institutes of Justinian in the 6th century prescribed a trichotomous uh, classification of legal persons, legal things and actions. And this was for the purposes of attributing rights and duties. Free men were deemed to be legal persons uh, who were full members of the moral community and attributed uh, certain legal rights. Animals, on the other hand, and very notably women, uh, slaves, children, and the mentally disabled, and others who were deemed to lack free will, uh, were deemed to be legal things over which legal persons could exercise certain rights. Uh, to ownership or to use to the exclusion of others. So you can see right from the very beginnings of recorded legal history, we see these parallels between uh, different, different types of discrimination and all based on the, the assumption of man's superiority over others. And unfortunately, these classifications uh, were, were uh, taken up by the English common law, the development of the English common law in the, in the Middle Ages uh, around the uh, 12th century. And the property status of animals was further fortified by successive legal, philosophical and theological thinkers. So it was a very um, anthropocentric worldview. Uh, where human beings, or at least free men, were seen to be at the centre of the universe and uh, everything else on Earth existed for his use. And at this time, animal welfare laws um, certainly didn't exist. They were unheard of and the state had uh, absolutely no right to interfere with how a person chose to use their animal property, regardless of how cruel that use may have been. And it wasn't until the uh, late 18th century that English legal philosopher Jeremy Bentham first proposed that animals should be afforded direct moral status simply by virtue of their sentience, that is their ability to experience pain and suffering. And he quite famously now argued that a full grown horse or dog is beyond comparison a more rational as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day or a week or even a month old. But suppose the case were otherwise, what would it avail? For the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So what Bentham was saying here is that uh, rationality, moral agency, higher intelligence, or the ability to comprehend the social contract, features that traditionally were uh, reasons to exclude people or, or animals from uh, the moral community, 
were not actually overly relevant to Bentham. It was simply the state of being sentient that was the necessary element to be provided with moral status and uh, to be afforded the benefits of equal consideration. Shortly after Bentham's contribution, the first laws to protect animals from cruelty were proposed in England. Following several failed attempts, the Act to prevent the cruel and improper treatment of cattle was finally passed in 1822, the first major animal protection law of its kind in the world. And perhaps in an early indication of the inter-animal -speci inter speciesist nature of the law, the Act, as the name applies, only applied to cattle. That was defined fairly broadly to include all livestock species and also uh, horses, but all other species of animal were excluded from the law's protection, including uh, companion animals like dogs and cats. Back in 19th century England, uh, those animals uh, simply uh, weren't as instrumentally valuable as livestock. They weren't very um, expedient in, in pulling carts or carriages or ploughs or providing food and fibre to the people of 19th century England. So uh, they simply weren't a, a priority back then, and which is quite ironic in contemporary terms because now it's, it's precisely that commercial or instrumental use of animals that leads to the, uh, to the watering down of, of protections for certain species of animals. And I'll, I'll get to how that, uh, that is uh, perpetuated through the law in a minute. But as time went on, uh, further species of animal were included in the laws uh, and further uh, protections were included. But fundamentally, the property law, common, uh, the, the common law property status of animals uh, remained. So the, our animal welfare laws today and the animal welfare laws of the past don't in any way alter that uh, common law property status. They simply place conditions upon how an animal owner can use their animal property. So today, our laws are certainly far more voluminous, uh, but still maintain the same basic structure of, of their predecessors in terms of prohibiting animal cruelty and imposing certain positive obligations on people to provide for the welfare of animals under their control. And what appears at, at first glance to be a fairly robust framework of protections quickly fades away when the myriad of qualifying terms, defences and exemptions are taken into account. Fundamentally, what it shows is that our animal welfare laws, while they purport to be based on a recognition of animal sentience, really have no consistent principled basis at all. Rather, the degree of protection we choose to afford uh, particular species of animals and the degree of pain and suffering we uh, choose to inflict upon them is really based in the most part on human caprice, whether in service to convenience, entertainment, preference, habit, greed, or some other human desire. There is no uh, consistent principle. So now I just want to address two key ways in which speciesism does manifest in the law. Um, and these include uh, the application of the principle of unnecessary harm and the use of wholesale exemptions for certain species in particular contexts. And as we're in Queensland, I'll use the, the law of the land to demonstrate, but these uh, examples are equivalent across jurisdictions throughout uh, Australia. So firstly, the principle of unnecessary harm. This concept really does underpin our entire animal welfare framework and it goes to the heart of what animal cruelty is. Every state and territory in Australia has an Animal Welfare Act or a Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act and all of those uh, acts uh, prohibit animal cruelty uh, which is generally defined as the infliction of unnecessary harm. They're all drafted in slightly different terms, but the, the general practical effect is the same. In Queensland, for instance, the terms uh, unjustifiable, unnecessary or unreasonable pain are used. And the legislation will go on to list certain specific acts that constitute animal cruelty, but the general basic fallback catch-all provision is this notion of unnecessary harm or pain or, or suffering, depending on the noun used to describe the requisite uh, consequence. So in other words, the infliction of pain itself is not an offence. It's only when uh, that pain can be said to be unnecessary in the circumstances that an offence uh, uh, can be found. So what is unnecessary harm? How do we determine this? Well, the courts have uh, established a fairly defined method for determining when an act can amount to unnecessary harm, and they apply what is referred to as a proportionality test. That is, they test to see whether the pain caused to the relevant animal is proportionate to the object sought to be achieved by the harm-causing practice. 
it requires the courts to first consider the purpose of the practice that is causing the harm and to determine whether or not that purpose is actually legitimate in the, in the outset. And almost all purposes for animal use will be considered to be legitimate at the outset almost without question. Only actions carried out for sadistic purposes or emissions through um, neglect or laziness will be deemed to be illegitimate forms of animal use and any pain um, suffered to animals as a result of those um, conditions will be deemed to be unnecessary and therefore constitute cruelty um, at the outset. And probably 90% of the animal cruelty prosecutions uh, in Australia are for offences of that nature. So fairly black and white, clear cut, sadistic uh, cases of sadistic cruelty or callous neglect. Any, any issues are usually uh, to do with evidentiary issues or procedural issues. But all other purposes for animal use uh, are deemed to be legitimate. So whether it's for food and fibre, uh, uh, scientific research or uh, even for entertainment, these are all deemed to be legitimate uses of our animal property. So once a legitimate use is established, then the court will go on to consider the means used to achieve that purpose. And uh, what they're looking at there is the degree of pain and suffering caused to the animal in the process to determine whether or not the amount of pain and suffering was proportionate to the purpose sought to be achieved. As Justice Hawkins outlined in the leading case of Ford and Wiley, the beneficial or useful end sought to be attained must be reasonably proportionate to the extent of the suffering caused, and in no case can substantial suffering be inflicted unless necessity for its infliction can reasonably be said to exist. So in a simplistic diagrammatical form, the proportionality approach may be portrayed um, like this, where you have the uh, legitimacy of the object or the, or the benefit to society on the, um, on the x-axis, or, or is it the, well, on the uh, vertical axis and the harm to the animals on the horizontal axis. And the dividing uh, diagonal line is the line of proportionality that represents the divide between what is deemed to be proportional harm and suffering or necessary harm and what is deemed to be disproportionate suffering or unnecessary harm amounting to animal cruelty. And as, as the diagram shows, the greater the legitimacy of the object, the greater the benefit to society, then the greater the extent of pain and suffering that can be caused to the animal, so long as there is a causal connection between the harm causing practice and the, and the uh, object sought to be achieved. Um, so for instance, just to explain, if, if someone was using an animal uh, for the purposes of entertainment, for instance, something someone might argue is fairly low on the scale of legitimacy, then the degree of pain and suffering that can be caused to an animal under the proportionality approach for that particular purpose would be quite limited. But on the other hand, if someone was using an animal, let's say, uh, for the purposes of medical research for a cure for cancer, for instance, something that someone would argue uh, is quite high on the scale of legitimacy, then the degree of pain and suffering, so long as, again, there's a causal connection, uh, could be fairly unlimited, really, under the proportionality approach. But as you've probably gathered just from this very brief um, explanation, the, the approach is very open to interpretation. Uh, it's quite vague, legitimacy of purpose, proportionality of means. What may have high legitimacy to one person may be a very low legitimacy to another, depending on the context and the circumstances. And likewise, what might be deemed to be proportional suffering might be totally disproportionate in the same set of circumstances, but to different people. So this highly malleable concept of proportionality is, of course, very open to corruption from the same psychological forces um, that perpetuate speciesist attitudes the subconscious biases that really nurture uh, and promote uh, speciesist tendencies. So while propor the proportionality line may be drawn here uh, for dogs and cats, for instance, in a domestic setting, when we consider other species of animals, for instance, farm animals in a commercial agricultural environment, all of a sudden the proportionality line may fall uh, and the extent of necessary harm may be deemed to be greater. Likewise, if we take other species of animals, uh, take the probably the most vilified and least protected of all being those species of animal we label as uh, feral or pests, and all of a sudden the proportionality line is dropped even further to the point where we almost 
uh, grant ourselves a, a de facto social licence to engage in cruelty towards them. And there's plenty of examples um, of, of that uh, around uh, Australia. The treatment of, of wild boar, for instance, in the, in the practice of pig dogging, which is uh, legal, um, is uh, an example. Uh, also, the, the treatment of cane toads, for instance, it's, it's somewhat of a, a joke, uh, a cultural sort of joke to take a golf club to a, to a cane toad. And there's really no um, legal, mechanisms, legal mechanisms to prevent to uh, prevent that. I mean, technically, you could argue that it's cruelty, uh, but if someone tried to prosecute someone for cruelty to a cane toad, it's likely that it would probably be dismissed for triviality. So that's the first uh, mechanism of speciesism uh, in the law that I wanted to address. The second relates to uh, the use of wholesale exemptions. So while our animal welfare laws do have some fairly robust protections, um, despite the, the qualifications I've just made there, the vast majority of animals that we actually use uh, aren't, afforded, aren't uh, afforded the protections that are provided by these laws. And I'm referring here to probably 95% of the animals that we use, and they are farm animals. So take, for instance, Queensland's uh, duty of care, which is a, a fairly um, uh, robust uh, provision providing many protections to animals. In, in Queensland, a person owes a duty of care to any animals under their control, which requires that person to provide um, uh, for animals under their control appropriate uh, food and water, uh, treatment for disease and injury, uh, appropriate living conditions, the ability to uh, display normal patterns of behaviour, and also uh, to ensure any handling of the animal is appropriate. So fairly comprehensive protections. But if we scroll down to part six of the Act, we're presented with six pages of various exemptions. And the exemption that I want to focus on is, is under section 40, and that is for a, uh, any act done in accordance with a code of practice, an industry-based code of practice, is exempt from the duty of care provisions or the animal cruelty provisions. So, in the case of farm animals, for instance, uh, this duty of care uh, is replaced by uh, a number of industry-based codes of practice. And it's within these industry-based codes of practice that you will find the procedures and the husbandry practices that really make up industrialised animal, animal agriculture, um, commonly known as factory farming. They prescribe the intensive confinement conditions for meat chickens, battery cages, and sow stalls measuring barely larger than the animal's physical body. And also the various routine surgical mutilations that can be performed, including tail docking, castration, beak trimming, teeth clipping, dehorning, mulesing, and even the spaying of adult cattle. And most of these procedures are carried out with no form of pain relief at all. It's a situation that US professor Bernie Rowlands describes as attempting to push square pegs through round holes. Instead of designing our agricultural systems of production around the physical and biological needs of the animal, we simply alter the physical form of the animals and completely disregard their psychological needs in order to make them fit our, the most economically efficient means of production that we can devise. The exemptions for these practices are an implicit admission that such practices would be likely to constitute animal cruelty if they were not so exempt. Why else would there be a need for the exemptions? They can, in this sense, I think, be fairly described as a form of legalised cruelty. What is permitted in relation to one species of animal would be a matter for prosecution if committed against another. So this legal speciesism really serves to reinforce the, the social and the psychological uh, processes that make up our speciesist attitudes. It's legal, therefore it's normal, it's okay. And it's a very circular logic because it became legal in the first place precisely because it was normal. The exemptions traditionally were focused just on uh, any routine livestock husbandry practice. So it became legal because it was normal. And now that it's legal, uh, the normalization of these practices um, is, is fortified. So it's a vicious cycle and it's a cycle that really can only be broken with objective scrutiny and a degree of, of moral enlightenment. And I'm just going to propose uh, very briefly a, a few legal strategies that may contribute to that moral enlightenment. Firstly, we must have an express recognition of animal sentience within our animal welfare legislation. We need to develop 
a more principled and consistent approach to animal welfare law and policy, and I think by expressly recognising sentience and its ethical relevance within the objects and the preamble clauses of our statutes, it will put sentience front and centre of the, of the framework. Respect for sentience must be a principle that runs throughout our animal welfare laws and our regulations, standards and our codes of practice that are developed underneath them. And this could partly be achieved, and this is the second proposal, uh, by placing further conditions on the development of such subordinate legislation to ensure it's consistent with the primary provisions of the animal welfare statute. So any, any code of practice or standard and guideline developed under the Animal Welfare Acts uh, cannot prescribe any practice that is going to uh, be in conflict with the duty of care provisions or the, or the, uh, the objects provisions of the primary statutes. Thirdly, we need to tighten the proportionality approach to determining when harm caused to an animal is unnecessary. For too long, the approach has resulted in an interpretation where necessity is reduced to mere convenience or preference. We need to bring necessity in the true sense of that term back into the equation where harm is only permitted where it is absolutely necessary and there are no uh, less uh, or non-harm causing alternatives available. And there are plenty of international um, examples uh, of, of how that provision can be redrafted. And finally, we need to establish a more democratically legitimate and procedurally fair approach to governing the development of animal welfare law and policy in this country. Vesting total control for these functions within agricultural institutions, including state and federal departments of agriculture and ministers for agriculture, who value animal welfare primarily by how it contributes to industry productivity, serves to ostracise the growing number of people who don't view animals in the same instrumental terms. An independent government institution is required to undertake or at least oversee these functions to ensure they're carried out in an impartial and principled fashion based on science and expert advice on animal welfare rather than political lobbying by interest groups. So while these proposed reforms certainly won't uh, completely eliminate speciesism from the law, I think they will go some way to ameliorating its effects. It has now been two and a quarter centuries since Jeremy Bentham first proposed that sentience was the only relevant criterion to granting the benefits of equal consideration to animals, and almost 150 years since Darwin fundamentally busted the myth of human exceptionalism by showing that the difference between human and non-human animals is not a matter of kind, but simply one of degree. Our challenge now is to make sure the 21st century is the century in which the law finally catches up. Thank you. <laughs>